Hi everyone, today I'm going to go through a presentation about the American Rescue Plan Act and our fourth version um, after a lot of research on what staff is recommending to City Council to act on with the American Rescue Plan funds. As a reminder, it's been a while since we've talked about this, so we thought it was important to go ahead and go through some of the parameters. We will be receiving $2,420,796. It'll be distributed in two payments, one last year, one this year. It can be used to respond to a public health emergency and the negative economic impacts, the revenue loss to replace revenue loss for the city, premium pay, and to invest in water, sewer, and broadband infrastructure. A special consideration in the act that passed was that this is a once in a generation opportunity. How are you investing in the future? What disparity or harm are you trying to address? And so they really did call that out during the legislation. And then finally, is your proposed project sustainable without future aid? Knowing that this is probably a one-time um, donation of funds from the federal government and we're not going to get it again. We can take our time. We have until the year 24 to decide how to use the funds and they need to be fully utilized by 26. And while that feels far away, uh, we know that large projects can sometimes take many years. And so the clock is ticking, 24 feels really soon and some really large projects that can't be completed by 26 shouldn't be on the list to be considered. We have done a lot of research with your feedback and discussion from the past work sessions. We've continued to try to align our recommendations with city council goals, especially your top priorities of housing, economic development, and climate sustainability. But we did look at all goals, including service excellence and town and gown relations. We reviewed the input that we received from the community. We did a few more listening sessions, and we feel it's an important time to do an update and some have discussion with you. As a reminder, we did a fair amount of community input back in May. So we did a business listening session and we also did an online business survey. We did a community broad survey to everyone and we did a listening session with our nonprofit partners. And then most recently we did a listening session with Parkview Arms and the Mighty Mobile Home Park communities. When we talked to our residents and our businesses, what we found is that in the short term, they really wanted us to work on supporting local businesses, supporting local nonprofits. Um, you can see the businesses here, the nonprofits, attracting new business and not affordable housing. And then we get into city infrastructure and then some of the smaller requests like vaccine and coordinating with Miami and, and climate. When you shift to the long-term focus, you see you know, a shift. And so you can see here that 33.5% uh, wanted us looking at city infrastructure and broadband. You see 18.99% wanting us to look at attracting new business and new visitors. 17.72% looking at affordable housing, 16.46% at supporting local nonprofits, and then it goes down into the other areas of supporting businesses, climate, and other, other things. We're also working on our comp plan and had a presentation the other day that just really was great, um, a great reminder. And it's just a reminder that in Ohio, income tax is the lifeblood of cities. It is the revenue that we bring in and provides the services that we do for our city and our residents. Um, this is how we fund all the things that a city does. Property tax funds schools. And so that's just an important reminder as we go through this. We had a major in impact from COVID on our income base. Um, you can see we lost income in uh, income tax. We lost funds in lodging tax. We lost funds in charges for services. And it was a really painful year. And to be honest, it really made us start to think about, should we diversify our economic base and try to bring in new jobs um, to increase our income tax base? We kind of realized we're a company town. We're lucky to be an amazing college town, but we are largely dependent on Miami University. And is it time for us to try to stretch that out just a little bit? It's something that we've been thinking a lot about. We also know that we have major housing needs. The housing study that we had done does show a critical need in homes that are targeted to those with lower to moderate incomes. And so we've been thinking a lot about that too. 
At the same time, we have to acknowledge that investment in housing has a cost to a city. This is a study done by Dublin, Ohio about the fiscal impacts of different types of investments. And you'll see that retail and housing actually has a cost that um, comes to a city. Whereas if you invest in like office development or industrial type properties, these tend to bring in new jobs, which then brings an income tax and helps the city. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't invest in housing or retail. It just means that you need to acknowledge the cost associated with it. So now I am going to talk to you about housing. Um, this is probably where we spent most of our time doing research, and our objective is to address affordable housing needs in our community. I want to give a special thank you to Seth Kropenbaker and the Housing Advisory Commission for all the research that they've been doing to assist with this presentation. We've already invested $150,000 in the purchase of land to provide for the cottage home community. This is in partnership with the community development professionals that will build 12 cottage homes on Hester Road. In the status that this one's in process, we've already begun work on this, and we worked on this for about two years before we were able to bring it forward to you. Our next recommendation is that we want to establish a community land trust and nonprofit partnerships. The first nonprofit partnership that we want to continue is actually our partnership with the Family Resource Center. We want to give them $25,000 of our American Rescue Plan funds this year while we wait for the short-term rental lodging tax fund to get established. Then in the future, we see that donating the proceeds from the short-term rental lodging tax to their organization will help with a case manager who helps with finding housing. Last year, we gave a little over 21,000 of our CARES Act money to the Family Resource Center for a 0.6 FTE case manager. This individual is able to help 13 families find permanent housing after using a cold shelter. This is a tremendous accomplishment and we feel like this is something we should support in the future. These funds, the 25,000 this year, and the 20,000 that we're recommending for future years from the short-term rental tax is in addition to the annual donation of 48,600 that we give to the Family Resource Center. We do want to acknowledge that the Family Resource Center did ask for support of two FTE case managers, but we do feel pretty strongly that the rescue plan fund should not be used for operations because when the funds are gone, there's nothing left. And so it's not sustainable. Hence our recommendation of the 20,000 from the short-term rental lodging tax. Our next recommendation is to create a community land trust. I have a brief video to show you that really goes into how a community land trust works. It's on YouTube and there's a little ad, but we'll get through that. And then it's a great video to explain how these, this works. Wow, look at this. 94% of people believe company culture is Community land trusts, or CLTs, are nonprofit organizations that acquire, own, and steward land permanently for the common good. The most common CLT land use is housing, but retail, office, and a variety of other uses are possible. CLTs give formal decision-making voice and power to local community residents in determining land uses. Here's how CLTs make home buying affordable for families in their communities. First, the CLT builds or buys homes using one-time public or private investment. Next, the CLT sells just the home to a low-income buyer who qualifies for a mortgage, and the CLT keeps the land, holding it in trust for future generations of home buyers. In return for being able to buy a home at a discounted price, the family agrees to pay it forward and sell to another low-income family at a price they can afford. The CLT manages the sales process, ensuring that each home buying family builds some wealth from a predetermined limited amount of the sales proceeds. In this way, the one-time public or private investment in CLT homes makes lasting affordability a reality and stabilizes communities. And CLTs benefit the larger community too, as they preserve and protect housing for long-term residents, helping to build stronger, safer, and higher quality diverse neighborhoods contributing to greater educational attainment, employment opportunities, and health outcomes. Visit GroundedSolutions.org to learn more about CLTs today.
So that's just a, a great video that explains how community land trusts work. And we have found a lot of research that shows that this is a really strong model for keeping housing affordable into the future. Unlike some other programs such as down payment assistance, where you help a family one time, they buy their home and then they sell it and they move on. This, this keeps the full home affordable for the next buyer too, um, because that pay it forward concept. So you can sell your home and you can actually sell it at a, and make a little bit of income, but your selling rate in the future is set by a formula with the community land trust nonprofit. So you can't really flip a home. And so that's an important distinction with this. And we think it's a really good model for us to explore. So how do we think a community land trust can be established in our community? The city does own 47 acres of land on 732 heading south of town. And we think that a portion of this, not all of it, a portion of this would be appropriate for a community land trust. We're recommending that we conduct a master plan that will outline the entire design of those 47 acres. So let's look at including a park-like area, um, a natural preserve area. Let's look at where the Episcopal Retirement Services um, project is going to go, which they're already in work doing eight acres with 40 units. Let's determine an area for the community land trust, and then let's determine an area Area for possibly additional single family homes. We can look at that all together and kind of design that acreage for how we want to use it for the city. And or we can do both or one or the other. We can also look to acquire and purchase property around town. A lot of other communities identify blighted homes and buy them and then you know they, they fix them up and sell them. Um, and we would need to try to find sellers at the right price at the right price. As of now, we haven't explored um, any sellers around town and we haven't identified any blight, but it's just another approach that you could use. The master plan cost at the high end would be 45,000 um, and we would recommend this. So what would our nonprofit partner do? Um, we really believe that a nonprofit partner could help us manage the community land trust. And they really do act as a realtor and they manage the future sales of homes and determine eligibility, help people get their mortgage, you know, things like that. Together, we would, um, with the city assistance, we would apply for community development block grants, CDBG, and home fund grants um, to help expand this program in the future. We could help together develop protocols for the community land trust and educate the public about it. And then hopefully in the future, we can kind of continue to invest in affording affordable housing projects in our community. So again, the way that a nonprofit get what, gets what they need out of this would be they would get a percent of the home sale fees, very similar to a realtor model. So some of the other research we've done with establishing a community land trust is that the homes are targeted to families who are in the low to moderate income uh, level. This threshold is kind of low and it can exclude some families that are working families, but it does allow you to pair it with the CDBG and home funds. As of 2020, the limit for a four person family was $69,000 a year. If you don't use CDBG and home funds, you can probably set your own limit of what that threshold is of affordable in your community. It's just something for us to consider. Our housing study does show that we need to have 323 units, according to the study, of under 1,000 a month price range. And another thing our research showed us was that many community land trusts keep 50% of their property as rental, and then the income from the rentals goes to the operations of their staff and, and things like that. And then they keep 50% into homes that are then sold to private homeowners. We ran a lot of numbers and to have a nonprofit that's self-sustaining, that works in our community, we would need 15 to 20 um, housing units as rentals. It, and we just don't have the money to invest in that right of way. And so what we're recommending is that we start with selling homes and eventually we could possibly grow to having rental properties as well. So now that we've talked about what a community land trust is and how we think we can work with a nonprofit, we have three concrete housing approaches that we'd like to show with you. And then we have a recommendation at the end. The first option one is a public private partnership approach. 
we're recommending investing $1 million into infrastructure of the 47 acres that the city owns, not the whole 47, but you know, part of it, into roads, sidewalks, and sewer. Then for that land, we would do an RFP for a developer, for private developer, to give us their best ideas and in a, price, a set price range of the homes that we want to see. The land, they would have no cost in the land and we would help them with their infrastructure. So the hope is that they could come back with some strong ideas of affordable homes. The developer would invest in building those homes and the developer would get the proceeds of the first sale of that home. But because we've already established a community land trust, all future sales of those homes would go through that nonprofit partner and would be sold at that formula that we talked about just a little bit ago. The sustainability of this program would be that we could work with CDBG funds and home funds that we estimate would be about 200,000 to 300,000 a year that could be applied to continue to assist private developers with infrastructure to help them build LMI homes for families. The pros of this approach is that we would use a city land asset to promote home investment and the city can choose its partner through an RFP process. Based on the developer's resources, it could yield more homes in a shorter time frame because they get the proceeds from those first sales. The cons is that it limits the development of affordable homes in one area. It's unknown if there's a developer out there who has any interest in this. We really don't know if anyone would respond um, or if it's something that they would choose to do. We could face neighborhood concerns. And in the future, that 200 to 300,000 a year may not be a large enough incentive to entice developers to provide LMI. We just don't know. Our second option is a public nonprofit partnership approach. Again, we're recommending investing $1 million and these funds can be used to acquire vacant property or um, and build out infrastructure and work with nonprofits to build new homes for LMI families. Nonprofits such as Neighborhood Housing, Habitat for Humanity, and the community development professionals like the cottage community are all good examples of how this could work. The other thing you could do is to acquire existing homes, work with a nonprofit to fix them up, and then sell them to an LMI family. The sustainability of this model is similar, where we would use the CDBG funds and home funds that we would apply for, and you could just kind of do a little bit each year um, to help get more and more property that is affordable. The pros and cons review of this approach is that the pros would be that an the LMI properties can be built and acquired around the city. They're not all in one place. It's a very slow and steady approach working with existing knowledgeable housing partners, such as Butler County Neighborhood Housing Authority, Habitat for Humanity, Community Development Professionals, et cetera. The cons is that we don't know if property sellers would want to sell to us, and it could take a long time to build several LMI units around town. Our third option is a city-led construction approach with a $1 million investment. In this instance, the city would actually hire a contractor to build units that were meant for LMI families. We think we could do four to five units. It might be as low as three, um, but the idea is that we would contract with someone to build the homes on a part of the city-owned land, and then these homes would be sold through the nonprofit partner who acts as their realtor, but then those funds come back to the city. Um, and then we as a city can reinvest those funds in future affordable housing solutions. The pros and cons review of this is that again, we're taking a house steps toward affordable housing and can be built over time. Having those um, proceeds from those first sale of homes come back to the city or our partner means that we can direct the reinvestment of those funds into future affordable housing projects. Over time, it would allow for LMI homes to be placed in different parts of the city. And again, it encourages home ownership for LMI families. The cons of this approach is that the capacity is very small, maybe five units if we're lucky. And the staffing, we may have a staffing time resource of managing this project. And then again, we may face neighborhood concerns. Our recommendations after all of this research and thinking about all of the things going into this is the following. We think we should do the 25,000 to the Family Resource Center for the Housing Case Manager staff. We'd like to do a 40, up to a $45,000 master plan for the 47 acres of the city-owned land. 
We've already invested the 150,000 for the cottage community. And we are recommending option three, the city investment of 1 million in construction of affordable units. In the future, the proceeds from these initial home sales can be invested in future affordable housing projects. When paired with CDBG and home funds to either build new homes or acquire property around town, it really becomes an impactful program that can live into the future. The investment is $1,220,000 of the American Rescue Plan funds. Of special note in the housing category is that these recommendations do not leave funds for the one-stop social service center that we had talked about or a city-sponsored cold shelter. I do want to let you know that the Family Resource Center does continues to do a tremendous job with working with a local hotel to provide an emergency cold shelter. And we've been able to work with them to find other funders through other um, grant sources and things like that to fund their cold shelter for this winter. And we think that by working with uh, the Housing Coalition in the Butler County and others, that we can continue to probably find funding for the winter cold shelter by working together with FRC in future years. We want to let you know that we also continue to explore other housing options, not using American Rescue Plan funds, but such as working with area employers to provide workforce housing. We have kind of some exciting models that we're working on, and we'll bring those forward soon if we can get them off the ground. And then finally, I want to make sure that we're clear that no agreement has been formalized with any nonprofit, but we feel confident that the presented models can be worked out. We've been speaking with a lot of nonprofits. We've been interviewing them, learning from them. They've been tremendous to work with, but we haven't signed any formal agreements. This is the end of the housing portion. And next I'm gonna move into economic development. With economic development, our objective is to encourage high quality job growth in our community. And my goal would be hundred new jobs making 20 plus an hour. And I'm gonna say in the next five years, we're already, in, we've already invested 113,000 in our partnership with the College at Elm, which is hope, hopefully will bring 15 new full-time jobs making at least 18 plus an hour, so close to that 20. And then we're also recommending that we use 266,000 to go ahead and finish the ADA um, compliant curbs, and that will free up those CDBG funds in the future to go back to the housing that we were just talking about. So the status is it's in process. Next, we'd like to bring forward an idea of a workforce development center. We've been working very closely with Talawanda School District, Butler Tech, and Cincinnati State on the idea of trades education in our community. And so the idea is that we would build an industrial arts center that would teach mechanical engineering, machine operations, basic carpentry, basically bringing shop class back to school. Um, we can call it industrial arts center, we can call it steam lab, but the idea is that we're going to teach kids hands-on education in these skill sets. And youth who really like it can actually create a pathway that goes right into an apprenticeship model, right into a job, or right into a placement with a university partnership that we're working on. The concept is that during the day, high school students could have this educational opportunity, but then in the evening, Butler Tech and Cincinnati State would actually, this would be a satellite location for them where they would teach adults um, these skill sets so that adults can become re-educated and re-enter the workforce, perhaps in a higher paying job. We're really excited about this. Um, this 400,000 would be a matching portion of a future grant that we would need to apply to pay for the whole project. We're actively working on this. We need to get the entire project cost together, but I feel like it's a good model and I feel like we could try to find some good grants to support this initiative. So stay tuned on this one. The pros that we kind of talked about a little bit already is that we would be educating youth in skills that are needed by area employers. We have interviewed many area employers and these are the skill sets they're looking for. Uh, we have a lot of partners that we're working with. It also lends toward adult re-education without having to drive a long distance. It would be a satellite that's available to our community. And we really think that we could help people get new, high, higher quality jobs and, and a better quality of life. The cons would be that the funds do not fully cover the construction or build out of the space. We would need additional grants. The sustainability of the center may need continued support. So we're seeking um, corporate partners. And then we need to really assess, do we have like the scale of this? What is the size of our population need that we've used as such, this kind of facility? 
And then, you know, you would have the risk of training people and then not staying in your community. But we have a great community. We think they'll stay. And then finally, you know, we have about $400,000 left. And so we've been thinking a lot about economic development and researching what other communities are doing. And especially communities that are kind of really moving and shaking with economic development. And what we found is that communities um, are using funds to purchase commercial land. Um, and sometimes they're using the community land trust model that we just talked about for commercial development. Others are purchasing commercial property and then selling it at a very affordable rate to a new developer with the goal of having new jobs in their community. And then other communities are using their funds to invest in water and sewer infrastructure for commercial projects to really offset those developers' costs. They're really working as a partnership to try to encourage development in their community. You know, I hear a lot from people saying like, look what Hamilton's doing and look how much they're growing. And, you know, Hamilton's really investing in economic development through these, um, through these formats. You know, they're investing in buying buildings and then selling them at affordable rates. They're investing in infrastructure. And the city of Oxford never really tried this before. And so if this is something that we're serious about, we can begin to try it. So the pros would be, if it works, it could bring new jobs to the region and increase our income tax base. An increase in our income tax base means that we can provide more services for our community. That's something to really think about. You know, we believe that we could attract research and development or light industrial. Many cities have had success with this model. And Miami University is a very willing partner with business recruitment, especially with all the outreach we're doing right now with College at Elm. This could almost be like a College at Elm part two. And, you know, helping people get high quality jobs means higher quality of life. And hopefully they would stay and be residents in our community. The cons would be trying to find land available um, in an office or industrial zone. And then, you know, you do have the risk of attracting an unknown employer. The next thing I'm going to talk about is really a pivot. Uh, oh, I got ahead of myself. Pardon me. Our recommendations for economic development is that we would do the 113000 that we already did for College at Elm. We would do the 266,000 for the CURB um, ADA compliance project. We would do 400,000 for that workforce development building, the, the um, trades education that we were talking about at, with Talawanda. And then we would look to acquire commercial land or support infrastructure for commercial development at 400,000. The American Rescue Plan investment would be $1,179,000. Now, we're going to show one more option of a pivot. The other thing that we could explore doing is a complete pivot away from housing or economic development and instead use our American Rescue Plan funds for existing capital projects and programs. We're going to be spending this money anyway so we could you know, help the city save money. And then in theory, you can kind of set that money aside that you saved for other projects of council initiatives that you want to work on. So some of the projects that we do have here are water and wastewater pro uh, improvements that we've been talking about, Oxford Area Trail or other bike and pedestrian infrastructure improvements, a courthouse improvement that will help with accessibility and AV equipment. You know, we talk a lot about snow removal um, for AV accessibility, so we can look at snow removal equipment for sidewalks. We have the Amtrak project and climate infrastructure. Those are just all examples of what we could do. So now it really is time for discussion. What direction do you want us to go? Based on your feedback, what we're going to do is with your feedback, if we hear something that you like, we will bring forward each individual project for you to vote on in future meetings. We're not going to really have you vote on one big lump project and instead we'll bring in individual pieces to be voted on individually. There's a lot to talk about, which is why we recorded this ahead of time. And now I invite us to enter into discussion. Thank you so much.